Let me add one more on, on top of the pile of the worst case analysis. So what people talk about, which is hurricanes and earthquakes, does is there a connection that's well understood between climate change and uh, the increased frequency and intensity of hurricanes and earthquakes? I've dug in on both a lot. Uh, the earthquake connection to climate change, I'm not worried about compared to the, just the earthquake risk that we live with in many parts of the world already. The Himalayas, even with that earthquake in 2015 in Kathmandu, that whole range is overdue for major earthquakes. And what has happened in the last 50 years since they last had big earthquakes, huge development, big cities, a lot of informal construction, like the stuff I wrote about in Istanbul, where the family builds another layer and another, they put a floor on every time someone gets married and has kids, <laughs> you put another floor in your house. And unfortunately, that's, you, you know, the what was the term this Turkish um, engineer? Um, r rubble in waiting. Rubble in waiting. It's rubble in waiting. And we're looking at it, you know, videotaping it. And there are people playing there. Uh, so I don't worry about the earthquake connection to climate change. The hurricanes I've written about for decades. Um, and the most illuminating body of science that I've dug in on, literally, <laughs> related to hurricanes is this field that's emerged. It gets a tiny bit of money compared to like climate modeling. It's called paleotempestology. It's like paleontology, you know? Mm -hmm. They look for evidence of past hurricanes uh, along coasts that we care about. And they dig down into the lagoons behind like the barrier beaches uh, along Florida or the Carolinas or in Puerto Rico. And what you have is a history book of past hurricanes. So there's this mud, 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 you know, accumulating over centuries. And then there's a layer of sand and seashells. And what that indicates is that there was a great storm that came across the beach, pushed a lot of sediment into the mud. And then there's mud, 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 mud. And when you look at that work, I first wrote about this in 2001 in the Times, in a long story, and then I've kept track of these intrepid scientists putting these core tubes down. And it shows you that we're in a landscape where big, bad hurricanes are not, they're the norm, but something that's rare and big is something that's extreme. When you think about the word extreme, right? It means it's at the end of the spectrum of what's possible. They're rare. Rare in human time scales. Um, Hurricane Michael, four years ago, devastated. Category five came ashore in the panhandle of Florida, leveled that much photographed town, Mexico Beach. And um, people were, actually, the Tallahassee National Weather Service said, unprecedented hurricane. And the damage was unprecedented because there hadn't been a community there before. But the hurricane was not unprecedented at all. If you look at the history, and this is published research, it's just that no one bothers to, we have this blind spot for um, the longer time scale you need to examine if you're thinking about big bad things that are rare. And hurricanes are still rare. I was recently covering Fort Myers, the, the awful devastation. There's a young uh, climate scientist at Florida Gulf Coast University, Joe Muller, who's done that paleo tempestology work there, right in Fort Myers. She lives there, and she was away in London at a meeting of reinsurance companies that reinsure all the world's big bad risks yeah. when this was happening. But she has done the work that shows uh, it's a thousand year record of past hurricanes, and it's super sobering. When you consider how fast people have moved into Florida and built vulnerably in an area that hurricanes will hammer, that it part of the fundamental dynamics of the Gulf of Mexico and the, the storms come off of Africa. It's a place where they would come. Now, the question of global warming impact is subtle. There are aspects of hurricanes that haven't changed. There's aspects like rainfall that seem pretty powerfully linked to global warming. A warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. So when you have a big disturbance, like a the heat engine of a hurricane comes through it, you get more rain. Um, there's rapid intensification, you know, how, how quickly these storms jump from like, you know, category one to five or four before they hit is, an, is a new area of science. So I think it's still early days in knowing, because no one was looking for that. There were no data back 300 years ago, you know, when these big bad previous hurricanes came to know whether they were rapidly intensified or not. So I, I as a journalist, I try to 
you know, keep track of what we don't know, not be too constrained and think about new science as being, you know, robust unless it's considering and actually actively stating we don't really know what's going on with earlier hurricanes. And all of that is swamped ultimately, literally, by the vulnerability, building vulnerability in these areas. You know, if, if there's a marginal change in a storm and you've quadrupled or sextupled how much stuff and how many people are in the way, and if some of those people are poor and vulnerable or elderly and can't swim, you're creating a landscape of destruction. So a lot of the human suffering that has to do with storms is about where and how you build versus the frequency and the intensity of storms. Still, and, and, you didn't quite yeah. answer okay. <laughs> the question, uh, you know, when I'm having a beer with people at a bar and they say, hey, why are you having a beer? We're all going to die because uh, of climate change. Usually what they bring up, uh, and I'm just trying to add some levity. No, this here. is good. Uh, usually what they bring up is, you know, the hurricanes and the rec most recent hurricane saying like this, they're, they're getting crazy hurricanes all the time. They're getting more intense, more frequent and so on. And is there... Uh, I'm sure there's incredible science going on trying to look at this. Uh, is there? Is it possible, is there evidence, and is it possible to have evidence that there's a connection between what would we can call global warming and the increased frequency and intensity of storms? No. And is, okay, no, thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> but, but you, but I... you added intensity, you know, it's, it's <laughs> let me just get into this a tiny bit more. I mean, hurricanes, I grew up with them in Rhode Island in the new, in, you know, in, in my youth, and there was a very active period of hurricanes in New England in the fifties and sixties, seventies, and then in the North Atlantic. Generally, was very, very active. In number fifty when I was a kid, and the dynamics of them forming off of Africa and coming here, circling up the coast, was just prime time. Then there was like what Kerry Emanuel, who's the most experienced hurricane climate scientist around at MIT. I, I, he was in, he's in this story. He's in, he's in my 1988 article. He and colleagues have found, and others, that there's what they call the hurricane drought from like the 70s through about 1994 in the Atlantic, specifically the Atlantic Basin. And there's been a lot of questions about that. People thought it was ocean circulation, something about the currents. There are these multi-decadal, variabilities in the oceans, right? And then now it looks robustly, I can't find a climate scientist who disagrees that the thing that caused the drought was pollution, smog. And significantly in Europe, and you say, well, how did smog in Europe relate to hurricanes crossing the Atlantic and getting to the United States? It's because of the smog was changing the behavior of the Sahara Desert, which is just south of Europe. And, and the Sahara Desert kills hurricanes, yeah. sand and dust coming off the Sahara. You can see this every year. And when that's active, it stifles these big storms at the point right in their nursery. They all form, there's this area for hurricanes off of West Africa. That's like the nursery zone. And so if you're stifling those hurricanes because of pollution in, in Europe before the Clean Air Act's kind of you know, cleanups, uh, and then that goes away. None of that has anything to do with global warming. It's another kind of forcing in the climate system, a local one that created a regional dynamic that created a quiet period when all these friends in the bar were maybe they maybe they were born you know in the nineties or whatever. They grew up in an area of like you know where no hurricanes weren't a big deal, um, and now we have an end to that drought because we cleaned up the air pollution the sooty kind of air pollution, sulfury, and anyone who says global warming, global warming, without saying, well, that's in there too, is kind of missing that. And when you look globally, you know, there's still, I think, was it 90 or so hurricanes a year, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, mm -hmm. globally. That hasn't changed. The number of these tropical storms that reach that ferocity has not changed. It's just a fundamental dynamic of and, and by the way, on the long time scale, the models still indicate as you warm the planet, and remember the Arctic warms quicker, this is something people probably understand, 
you're actually evening out the imbalance between the heat at the equator and the cold at the, at the, in the northern part of the hemisphere. And that calms the whole system down. So there could be fewer hurricanes later in the century because of global warming. And for me, you know, that's a lot of information. But if I'm in a bar, I start with, what, what do you care about? You care about safety. You care about security. You care about having everybody safe, not just you. You know, you get in your car and you can evacuate. What about the old person, you know, or the poor family who can't do that? They, they're not going to leave their house. What are we doing to limit vulnerability now? Uh, that, I, I circle back to that over and over again. I have like a pocket card. I have this graphic card I created uh, about risk. And like what we really care about is climate risk. Like who's at risk? What's driving the risk? How do you reduce that? It's a card, you can almost pull it out in a bar. I should print them. You should do that. It's you like, like, like risk, a risk is the hazard. <laughs> risk is the hazard. Like, you know, the hazard is, is a storm times exposure, how many people, how much stuff, and factoring in um, vulnerability or resilience. And climate change is changing the hazard for some things, not for tornadoes, not for, some, not for everything. Exposure is this expanding bullseye. I, this is another hashtag, expanding bullseye. Get out there and look for that and you'll see, I, I'm pushing these two geographers who do this for every hazard, wildfire, earthquake, flood, coastal storm, and we're building an expanding bullseye in an area and nature's throwing darts. Some of the darts are getting bigger because of global warming, some of the darts we don't know. What do you do? Like, what do you do? Well, you get out of the way, right? You don't wanna be on the dartboard. And that, it just simplifies the, the whole formula. Uh, to me, it, it was it's kind of a transformational uh, potential to go into a bar. Maybe I should print these things. <laughs> 100%. And they I should, should go coasters. drinking with you more often. They should be coasters in bars. Yeah. Because that was fascinating about smog. And I mean, it's just, it's nice to be reminded about how complicated and fascinating the weather system is. Let me try to answer the the, the questions slightly quicker before your, your friends have drunk too much. Uh, but Never you know, enough. <laughs> or not enough. Um, so if you look at the amount of, uh, of uh, the number of hurricanes, as, uh, as Andy rightly pointed out, um, it doesn't look like it's changing. So we see more because we have now much better detection systems with satellites. But if you look since uh, uh, 1980, when we have good satellite coverage, for instance, last year was the year that had the lowest number of hurricanes in the world. And you know, you, you're sort of like, that's, that's odd because it's probably the year where I heard the most about hurricanes. And what that tells you is that just because you hear a lot about hurricanes yeah. doesn't actually mean that there is a lot of hurricanes. You can't just go that way. If, if you remember uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, there was an enormous amount of talk about how violence, uh, how crime was getting worse in the US, while all the objective indicators showed that yeah. it was going down. But there's sufficient amount of violence that you can fill every radio and TV show with a new crime. And so if you get more and more TV shows that talk about crime, actually most people end up thinking that there's more crime while the real number is going down. So the reality here is, yes, climate change will probably affect uh, hurricanes in the sense that they'll be the same number or slightly fewer as Andy was mentioning, but they will likely be somewhat stronger. The ones this before. this seems to be the the best outcome. We're not sure, but this seems to be the uh, the outcome. And it's important to remember: stronger is worse than fewer is better. So overall, climate will make the world a little bit worse. So that's that's the that's the sort of bottom line. But and that's the real issue here. All the other things: the fact that people are much more vulnerable. Yeah. Is, is just vastly outweigh this, which is why if you look at the impact of hurricanes and impact of pretty much everything, it is typically going down. If you look, for instance, in percent of GDP, you have to look at percent of GDP because if you have twice as many houses, obviously, you know, the same kind of impact will have twice the, the impact or if they're twice as worth twice as much. If you do that in percent of GDP, and even the UN says that's how you should measure it, it's going down. Why is that? 
It's because we're becoming more resilient. You know, just simply, we, you know, if you look at what happens with when hurricanes come in, we have much better prediction in the long run. That means you now know, you know, two or three days out that there's a big hurricane that's likely to come here. What does that mean? All the things that can be moved. So, you know, typically all buses, all yeah. trucks, everything that's not bolted down will leave this area. And so you will get less damage from that. You will have more people knowing, oh, this is going to be a big one. They move to their relatives somewhere else. So you'll have fewer people being vulnerable. There's a if lot people of, are responsive and aware. Yeah, yeah there's, the there's a lot of way you can do this. Really so the, the outcome, and this is important for the whole conversation, the outcome is that we're actually becoming less vulnerable and that damages are becoming smaller, not bigger. But had there not been global warming, it would probably have gone down even faster so we would have become even better off quicker had there been no global warming. But this is a crucial difference. And this is what I find really hard to communicate. Climate change is not this, oh my God, everything is going off the, off the, off the charts and we're all going to be doomed kind of thing. Climate change is a, a thing that means we're going to get better slightly slower. And that's a very, very different kind of uh, attitude. It, it's yeah. one of the many problems rather than this is the end of all, all of us. And, and by the way, if you look at what's happening in the world, um, the data also show that in rich places and poor places, we still are moving into zones of hazard faster than climate is changing. Hmm. Beth Tellman was at Columbia and she moved to Arizona. She and colleagues at this outfit called Cloud to Street did an amazing study showing this is a year or so ago I wrote about showing, again, we're moving into zones of hazard, which it applies to me, um, just what Bjorn was saying, that we wouldn't be, people wouldn't be doing that if they thought that was going to lead to devastation. And this is today. We're, we're doing this now. And it's flood, flood zones, wildfire zones. So, so that means there's these things to do. You, there's so much plasticity in the human behavior and, and how we build and where we build, you can make a I mean, big, big change in the outcomes. I mean, one, one of the things to remember is, you know, people move to where hurricanes hit because when they're not there, it's a really beautiful place to be. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so in 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 many ways, we we make the trade offs and say, look, I'm I'm happy to live, you know, have an ocean view, and then maybe a hurricane is going to hit. And of course, it becomes a lot easier than when the federal government is actually subsidizing your risk by saying right. we'll insure you really cheaply. Uh, and that's one of the things that we should stop doing. Yeah. We should actually tell people, look, if you want to live where hurricanes hit, maybe you should be more careful. And yeah, by the way, what, what I was saying about um, past storms, the paleo tempestology, past fires, it's the same thing. We've, we've suppressed fire hmm. in the United States for 100 years through much of the West, through uh, wanting to save the forests, you know, the whole Smokey the Bear thing. Don't stop. When these were landscapes that were that evolved to burn. And what happened in the last 100 years? A lot of people love the West. We love we love these environments. We love to live with the trees. The Boulder County area, the explosive development in zones of implicit hazard leads to big bad outcomes when conditions align and climate change is worsening some of those conditions. And sometimes it's really counterintuitive. A wet season builds more grass. A dry season comes along, parches the grass. Then comes a human ignition. It's almost always human ignitions. And then you have this disaster where a thousand homes burn in Boulder County. And it's like, there's so many elements there that can be worked on that give me confidence that we can change these outcomes. You can, natural disasters are not natural. Disasters are, are designed, really, as some people say.